Hello and welcome to DigiLink's course Introduction to Python for Linguists. My name is Petra Bago. In this lesson we will learn more things we can do with strings. But first let's revise. Strings are immutable data types, which means that an object cannot be changed after it has been created. Every time we make a change, a new object is created. Strings are one or more characters enclosed by quotation marks. We can use either single quotes or double quotes. Now we can go to learning something new. One thing we can do with strings is concatenation. Concatenation is an operation of linking strings together. For this operation we use the operator plus. In the first example you can see that we concatenated a string Monty and a string Python. This operation just glues the second string on the first one. If we wanted to add a space between the two strings, we would have to add a third string in the middle of the two or just add a space at the end of the first or the beginning of the second string. Concatenation can also be done on part of a string. You already know how to do slicing. In the second example on the left we have two strings. String number one is Brad and string number two is Angelina. If we wanted to create a portmanteau word out of those two strings, we can take for example the first three characters from Brad and all the characters from Angelina except the first one. If we concatenate the sliced first string and the sliced second string, the program returns Brangelina. We have to be careful when concatenating different data types. Concatenation with strings can only be done with strings. So if we wanted to print a message, I was born in and then put an integer data type, the program will return an error saying that that is an error regarding types and that it cannot concatenate string and integer objects. This error message is great because it says exactly what our problem is. Since we already know that we can use a conversion function to convert an integer to a string, we can call the string function on the year. Of course, we could have just written everything in one message, I was born in 1990. However, we are lazy and we don't want to change the whole message every time we have to put another birth year in the message. We can do this by printing the message and referring to variable that has the birth year stored. We just have to convert that variable from an integer to a string. Look at the last example on the slide. We have a variable with information about the birth year. It is an integer data type. We have another variable with information about the current year. It is also an integer data type. We can now print a message using concatenation where it says if you were born in and then refer to the birth year and convert it to a string, you are and then subtract the birth year from the current year and convert it to a string. We can change the birth years and the current years and get the age of the person without having to do division ourselves. One very useful function we can use on strings, but also on some other data types, is the len function. Len comes from length. This function returns the number of items in an object. Items in a string are characters. So when len function is called on a string, it returns the number of characters in the string. We will also use this function on lists and dictionaries. When used on lists, it returns the number of elements in a list. And when used on dictionaries, it returns the number of elements in a dictionary, which are key value pairs. For example, when we call a len function on a string spam, the program returns 4. Can you guess what data type is the output of the len function? Of course, it is an integer. And we know what operations we can do on integers. Let's take a look at some methods we can call on strings. We have already said that a method is a type of function that is associated with an object. 
A method performs tasks on objects. We will mention eight methods that can be called on strings. We will also see norms used to describe methods in Python documentation. So let's start with the first method. The first method we'll mention is the upper method. This method returns a new string with all letters converted to uppercase. The syntax for the method is the following. First, we state the string the method is called on, then period, and then upper, well, the name of the method, and then open round bracket and closed round bracket. Nothing goes in the brackets. And that's it. For example, we can create a string Monty Python and store it in a variable named s1. And we can say print s1 period upper open bracket close bracket. The program returns Monty Python in capital letters. Here we have to realize that the method returns a new string. That means that our original string s1 has not changed. Because strings are immutable, they cannot change without creating a new string. We can check this by printing the original string. And we will see that it is still the same. If we wanted to store this change, we have to assign the change to a variable. The next method we can call on strings is the lower method. As you have probably guessed, it returns a new string with all letters converted to lowercase. The syntax is the same as for the upper method. We state the string, then period, then lower, then open bracket, then close bracket. And the program returns a new string where all letters are lowercase. Again, the original string has not changed. The next method we can call on strings is the replace method. As you can see on the slide, the syntax for this method is a little different. In the round brackets, in italic is old, new, and count. The count is also in square brackets. Let's see what this all means. The arguments that are not in square brackets are mandatory arguments. Those arguments have to be defined in order for the method to work and the program not to return an error. This means that the replace method has two mandatory arguments, old and new. The arguments that are in square brackets are optional. These arguments are not needed in order for the method to work. You can put them or not put them. That depends on what you have to do. So the replace method has one optional argument count. And what does this method do? Well, it returns a new string where an old substring defined in the old argument is replaced with the new substring defined in the new argument. That is why these two arguments are mandatory. In order to replace something, you have to know what you are replacing, the old, and you have to know what you are replacing it with, the new. The third argument is optional and it defines an integer saying how many times will the replacement occur. If we leave this argument out, the program assumes we want it to make all the changes. If we put some integer there, for example 3, the program will make only first three changes. On this slide you can see some examples. We have a string Monty Python stored in a variable s1. In the first case, we have replaced lowercase letter t with the uppercase letter t. In the second case, we have said that we wanted to do the same replacement, but this time we only want this replacement to occur once. So the program returned a new string where only the first occurrence of lowercase letter t was changed to an uppercase letter t. Again, the original string has not changed. The next method we will cover is the count method. As you can see, the syntax is a little different here. We have three arguments. One argument is mandatory. That is the sub-argument. The second argument is optional. That is the start argument. But what about the third argument? What does it mean when we have a square bracket within a square bracket? Well, 
It means that the third argument is also optional, but can be defined only if the second argument is defined. This means that the count method can have only one argument, the mandatory one. It can also have two arguments, the mandatory one and the first optional one, so the sub and the start. And it can have three arguments. It cannot have two arguments where one is the sub and the other is the end. Now you know how to read the square brackets within the square brackets. So what does this method do? It returns the number of occurrences of a substring. The first mandatory argument is the substring. We want to see how many times it occurs in our string. The second argument defines the number of index from which to start counting. We define this argument if we don't want to start counting from the beginning of our string, but from somewhere else. If we leave this argument out, the program assumes we want it to start from the index 0, that is, from the first character. However, if we do define the start argument, we can also decide if we want to define the end argument. The end argument defines the number of the last index. We define this argument if we don't want the counting to stop at the end of the string, but somewhere earlier. If we leave it out, the program assumes we want it to count until the last index, until the last character. Let's see a couple of examples. In the first case, we have only one argument. We want to count the number of times lowercase letter n appears in our string Monty Python. The program returns 2. In the second case, we want to count the number of times the lowercase letter n occurs, but starting from the index 3, that is from the fourth character. Remember zero-based numbering? The program returns 1. In the third case, we said that we want to start from index 3, but we also want to end the counting with index 7. And this time the program returns 0, because there is no occurrence of letter n between index 3 and index 7. Again, the original string has not changed. Let's go to the method find. This method returns the first index where a substring is found. It takes one mandatory argument, and that is the substring we are looking for. It takes one optional argument, and that is the index from where we want to start looking. If we don't define it, the program assumes we want to start from the beginning. And it takes a third argument only if the second argument is defined, to indicate the index where to stop looking. If we don't define it, the program assumes we want to go to the last index. Here are examples on how to implement the find method. Let's say we want to look for a substring on in our string Monty Python. We call the method find on our string and define the substring on in the round brackets. The program will return number one. It means that the first occurrence of on can be found in index 1, that is, starting from the second character in the string. If we want to start searching from the index 3, we define the start argument, and the program will return 10. That is the first occurrence of the substring on starting from index 3. In the last example, we defined the starting index 3 and the ending index 7. In this case, the program returned minus 1. Minus 1 does not mean that the substring starts from the last character. It means that the program could not find the substring from index 3 to index 7. It just means that the program found nothing. The next method is the strip method. The strip method returns a new string with a set of characters removed from the beginning and the end of the string. It takes one optional argument where we can define the characters we want it to remove from the beginning and the end of the string. If we don't define this argument, the program assumes we want it to remove white space. 
so space, tabulator, and new line. Let's see how strip works. We defined a string containing space, spam, space, and we store it in variable S3, let's say. That way we have white space at the beginning and the end of our string. When we call the method strip on our string, the program returns spam with no white space at the beginning or the end of the string. Again, our original string has not changed. Let's look at the last example. Here we've defined character space and m to be removed if found at the beginning or end of a string. Then we call the function strip on our string. And the program returns spa. It removed the space we have defined. And it removed the m because it was at the end of a string when it removed the space. It doesn't matter if we put space and then m or m and then space. The method will return the same result. The next method is the split method. This method returns a list, not a string, but a list of strings using a delimiter or a separator. The separator or the delimiter is an optional argument. When it is not defined, it uses whitespace as a delimiter for splits. When it is defined, it uses the, the defined characters as delimiters. It also takes one more optional argument, which we are not going to mention here. You can look this up in the Python documentation. Let's say we have a string nobody expects to Spanish Inquisition. When we call the method split on this string, we don't define the delimiter. The program will use the whitespace as a delimiter and return a list of five elements. The program started looking through the string to find the first occurrence of a white space. It found one after the character Y. So it stored everything before the white space as the first element of the list. Then it continued to the next white space. When it reached the second space, it took everything before the first and the second space and stored it as the second element. And so on. We can also define the delimiter. For example, we can use a lowercase letter e as a delimiter. The program will return a list with the weird elements as seen on the screen. If we as a delimiter define a character not found in our string, the program will return a list with one element containing the whole string. And finally, we came to the last method in this lesson. That is the join method. We can think of a join method as the opposite of the split method. It returns a new string which contains strings for example in a list and concatenated those strings using a delimiter. The string that is being used as a delimiter for concatenation is the string we call this function on. For example, we want to take one of the lists from the previous example and turn it back to a string. But this time we don't want the elements of the string to be concatenated by a space, but by a minus sign. So we call the join method on the minus sign. And we put the list as the mandatory argument. And the program will return a new string where all the elements of a list are concatenated using the minus sign. In this lesson we have covered a lot of methods to call on strings. Now we can say that we know how to work with strings. Let's see some code.